Deadly violence has erupted along the Gaza border today as the U.S. Embassy officially opened its doors in Jerusalem. The move has been met with anger from Palestinians who see East Jerusalem as a future capital. More than 50 Palestinian protesters have been killed, including six children. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is defending the country's action in Gaza, saying Israel has an obligation to defend the border. Nora Erekat is a human rights attorney, assistant professor at George Mason University, and a specialist in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. She joins me now from Washington. Nora, thank you for being with us. Dozens have been killed in clashes along the border today. It's become the deadliest day of violence in the region since 2014. Israel has been criticized for its response. Can you explain why Palestinians are so outraged by the embassy move? So let, let's just start by saying that there isn't a border with Israel. There is Israel has never declared its border. So what you have are the armistice, armistice lines from 1949 that also constitute the 1967 lines. And so there is no border. Number two, there were no clashes between Palestinians and Israelis because there's a buffer zone. So Palestinians who are gathering in order to protest their dispossession and removal and they're demanding their right to return as refugees um, are basically not confronted by any Israeli civilian not posing harm to any Israeli civilians, to any military installations, or to any Israeli soldiers. So there are no clashes. This was the lethal use of force against nonviolent protesters who did not pose a threat to Israel. Number three, this isn't just about the embassy move. Palestinians have been protesting for 70 years, demanding their right to return and their right to freedom. Since March 30th of this year, Palestinians have been gathering for the Great Return March, demanding that they have the right to return as refugees. It happens to coincide on the day that the U.S. is opening up its embassy in Jerusalem, and that is why there is a coincidence of these issues. But Palestinians are there every day protesting in silence or in marches with or without the spectacle of an embassy opening. So you do not believe then that Hamas is inciting these protesters? It has been made very clear that this is a gathering of Palestinian civil society who have organized themselves without any direction from Hamas and, in fact, in contravention to them. Hamas is not just Israel's nightmare. Palestinians don't want them either, but that is actually a scarecrow in this situation. When we continuously look at Hamas as the source of the issues, what we're doing is we are dehumanizing Palestinians who have been protesting for 70 years. Hamas wasn't created until 1987. Why were, protest why were Palestinians protesting before then? Mm -hmm. Palestinians are being removed in Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah, in Hizmet, within Israel, in Umm al-Hiran. There is no Hamas there. This is a scarecrow, and we should engage in more responsible discussion mm -hmm. about why Palestinians are protesting, how their human rights are being violated, and how Israel, Israel needs to be held to account. So obviously this goes back, as you said, 70 years. What is the significance of today's move, move of the U.S embassy to Jerusalem. For Israel declared its independence on May 14, 1948. Palestinians consider May 15, the day that their forced exile and removal was consecrated as their catastrophe or their Nakba. Unlike any other country where refugees are given the right to return, Israel has prohibited the Palestinian refugees from the right to go back to their own homes because it explicitly does not want to disrupt a Jewish demographic majority. It wants to enshrine a racial, religious supremacy, and the mere presence of Palestinians would you pen that. Now, already on the ground there is a situation of uh, de jure apartheid, but the return of refugees would make that more obvious because Israel does not want to absorb Palestinians into its citizenry because it would make it even more blatant and instead enshrines a policy of apartheid to, rem to uh, exclude them. Mm -hmm. from any benefits while it continues to regulate their lives. Now, just to get back to the issue of Hamas for a moment, I know you say that many Palestinians reject Hamas as well, but it does control Gaza and is helping to organize some of the organizations, and it has declared its intention to destroy Israel. So does Palestinian leadership need to acknowledge the right for Israel to exist in order to achieve peace? Do you think peace will come through a two-state solution? Do you know, I think your viewers should know, that Palestinians, the Palestinian National Council, 
recognized Israel's right to exist in 1988 and declared that Palestine will have an independent state in the West Bank and Gaza since 1988. They agreed to this again in 1993. This is an old situation. The only, the only entity that does not want a, a Israel's state within the 1967 borders is Israel itself because it wants the entirety of the land between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. It has obviated a sovereign Palestinian state. It is the source of dysfunction. Netanyahu Netanyahu has said numerous times there will never be a Palestinian state. When he says that, he's basically saying there's no two-state solution. It's really odd then that we go back and put the blame on Palestine for what Israel has torpedoed as the best way to ensure its, its uh, exclusive sovereignty. Um, and then about Hamas, it also merits mention that Hamas has recognized that it would enter into negotiations with Israel in a unity government and that it also endorses a two-state solution. So unless Unless we are, want to blatantly disregard the empirical evidence on file, we cannot pursue this line of reasoning. What would you suggest then at this point, you know, Palestinians do going forward? In Jared Kushner's speech at the opening of the embassy, he said, and this is his opinion, Palestinians participating in the Gaza border protests are, quote, part of the problem and not part of the solution. What is your response? What should Palestinians do? You know, I wonder, I ask myself the same thing. What should Palestinians do? How much more do they need to do to protest peacefully, to, 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 to have barbecues at the border, to fly kites, to have circuses, to actually participate in flotillas that are breaking, breaking the blockade, to engage in boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel? We have tried almost everything, and everything that we do, we're being told that it's our fault that we can't be free. That's the problem. It's almost like telling black Americans, you can't be free unless you just capitulate and stop protesting and stop demanding equality and stop demanding freedom as if it was MLK's fault for crossing the bridge in Selma and not the fault of white supremacy that was subjugating a population unreasonably, cruelly, immorally. So my question is, what will it take for the international community to finally respond and say, how many poor Palestinians need to be killed? Six children were killed today. 108 Palestinians have been killed since March 30th. How many more decades do they need to endure this subjugation before there is a shift in this unreasonable status quo? And what would you recommend? I would recommend freedom. I would recommend a world that is the exact opposite of what Trump and Netanyahu are driving us into, which is a, a, a series of garrison states of exclusive, explicit, racial, uh, religious supremacy. I would engage in a world where we actually are, are believe that all humans are created equal, where we're actually engaging in a universalist uh, vision, where we, all of us, it's all of us or none of us, but who where should, there is room for everybody, and that's what Palestinians are demanding. And who they're only demanding. But who, who would you say is the leadership that should negotiate this? I mean, Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas has now said... Negotiate what? Negotiate what? The Palestinians have been negotiating for 25 years, and in every series of negotiations, what has been offered to them, if you, if you study the text, what has been offered to them is a series of autonomous regions where they don't exercise sovereignty. They are being given the choice of how to decorate their prison cells. They are not being given the choice to be free. If Palestinians want to negotiate, they said in 19. We recognize Israel. We just want a state alongside Israel. There was there, that wasn't in contest. The only impediment to that realization has been Israel itself. So why don't we start shifting the conversation and ask Israel why it doesn't want to negotiate with Palestinians? Why it doesn't want to recognize their right to exist? Why it wants to maintain a supremacist regime that uh, provides racial benefits based on on religion rather than on human existence? Nora Erakat, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me.